Any week that Ultimate Spider-Man drops is a good one, and this is one of those weeks. The gang is all here for a jam-packed episode of Pals Pulls. We have Kale. What's up, hot dogs? Marco. Spray, spray. Tyler. I don't... I understand Kale's intros. I'd never understand Marco's. It was like, instead of thwip, it was a spray. Ew. What That's you worse. And I'm Sean. We have six. <laughs> How many? Six of this week's biggest book releases on tap to talk about today. We have the aforementioned Ultimate Spider-Man number three. We have Rise of the Powers of X number three. X-Force number 50, the finale of that series. Primer number one. Go oh, see. Batman Dark Age number one, which won the listener poll this week, and the Six Fingers number two. So some pretty, some pretty big books, some pretty good books. Well, that'll be determined in the reviews. Let's talk I'll about. I'll be the judge of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about one. Uh, well, before we talk about one, I do want to say hello to everybody that is watching us now or in the future. Live viewers, thanks for hanging out with us. We always appreciate you guys coming. And uh, it's always a good time with you all. We will get to your comments and questions and everything else. Uh, as we go forward, let's talk about Ultimate Spider-Man number three. Okay. This is written by Jonathan Hickman with art by Marco Cicchetto, colors by Matthew Wilson, and letters by Corey Pettit. Man, if this isn't a fun-ass comic book. Uh, it's It's... It's, you know, Spider-Man, one part father, being a dad, you know, kind of having an adventure with his daughter. And, you know, a scene that I think a lot of us were wondering how we would get to it. And, and it's a lot of fun. Um, also being a sort of a son, but also, a, also a, you know, an adult with a job, you know, wondering what's going on with Uncle Ben and J. Jonah Jameson and getting in the mix with them as they try to uncover what's happening with Fisk. And then there's Spider-Man. And it's Spider-Man and the Green Goblin versus Bullseye. That's everything that happens in this book. It's the it's the intricacies of those scenes, and it's the character work, and it's the art that makes this such a good comic book. I finally feel like we're getting somewhere with this. I felt like the first two were a, a kind of... It felt like it was going a little slow, but I'm glad they do the reveal at the end of this issue. Um I think it's necessary. If the can I say it? Are we allowed to spoil? Can we do spoiler? Yeah, words? yeah. Full spoiler. I mean, yeah. it's not really a spoiler. The Green Goblin reveals himself as Harry, and Wild, forces wildly predictable. Yeah, and they for, they force the reveal of, of Peter as well to Harry. And I'm glad they got out, that out of the way now. Like, if it was going to be Harry, just do it. Don't don't prolong that, um, unless it was going going to be some kind of surprise on who it was. Um, I like how that gives Peter another dynamic to work with. You know, now he has to deal with it's his work friend, you know, essentially at this point. <laughs> um, so I'm curious to see where, where that goes and how that is different than what we've gotten in the main 616. And uh, to what you mentioned uh, at the top, just in terms of character work, um, we started out the gate with that that father aspect of the scene of the costumes. Man, just pure joy. The it, scene it, of the costumes? Explain it. Uh, just it being where Peter's trying out different uh, styles and uh, Mays are going, no, maybe add some color, maybe a little less scary. It's just cutesy moments that I think help to flesh out this version of, of Spider-Man, especially knowing that he's coming into this as a father, right? I think it also is adding, not stakes, but showing you what could potentially, what is potentially at risk, right? And, and as much as he is um, going to lean into the, the super heroics, he uh, he does have other things to to take care of and care about, and um, this is a way to show that that sympathy. Yeah. So Marco Marco referred to the scene where Peter gets his costume. Yeah. And it's a scene that is a whole lot of fun. You know, uh, his daughter's just watching him sort of adjust his suit and get these different designs that are all coming from his brain. 
Um, which of course, you know, you have to stretch your 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 mind a little bit. But I like the fact that the the spider design is not it's not always like perfect. It looks a little mm-hmm. weird. Um, because it's just coming from the mind of a dude who's, you know, a, a non-artist. Um, but there was actually something in this scene that stuck out to me that I wonder if you guys had any um any opinion about. So the first time that he changes his costume, she says it's scary. And it's there's an emphasis because she says it twice that it's scary. And it's it's a black costume. It's the it's the black and white costume, not Venom. It doesn't look exactly like that. It kind of reminds me of the of the Spider-Man 3 Venom costume in a way. Mm, yeah. Um but I I was wondering if that was a bit of like foreshadowing on Hickman's part. Did anyone else feel that way? I thought that was more of a ch- tongue in cheek play. I mean, she said the original costume was scary too, which was just black. Um and then you add a creepy spider to it probably makes it a little more scary. Um, I don't want him touching that this early on. <laughs> like, I'm okay with never having to deal with the symbiote Spider-Man in this world. Or, or well, at least... the, um, yeah. The, um, the way the, uh, the mask fizzles away, uh, later as well, when Harry forces the reveal, that felt very symbiote to me too, and it burns yeah. away black in that same way. So, uh, yeah, I could see it. I didn't think about it, but I could see it. I really like Chiquetto's des- like design for Spider-Man, though. It's classic. It's not that different than anything we've seen, but I like the spider. It's a little different, um, and it's just so, so clean, man. What a tremendous artist. I think it's closer to the original. Like yeah. The, you know, the, the O-O-O-G, mm-hmm. you know. I even like the the jokes and the the alternate costumes he had, even though it, it feels like the Spider Man game costumes at some point, you know. But there's a, there's a joke to the Ben Riley costume, Iron Spider, and like the Fantastic Four thing. So, um, I, I think that that hoodie one still looks good, like even the one Chetto draws here. I'm a big fan of the the hoodie Scarlet Spider, but we're old apparently. I guess so. Yeah. Um, were you guys <laughs> were you guys disappointed at all that it? ends up being the classic suit i mean we knew it was i no. was honestly yeah 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 really i just it, like it just makes sense i feel like does it make sense though like it's a whole new world it almost makes less sense that it's identical almost identical to the original suit well it's he, his destiny right so yeah yeah that's what i sort of thought i'm like he's gonna end up doing that and similarly i thought that of harry it's ultimately going to end up being because that's maybe there's some destiny there to some degree as well. I hate that even more. <laughs> like I understand color theory, primary colors are going to be like the good guy, but like what's, what about red and blue scream spider? He wasn't even bitten by a spider, you know, like he, had, <laughs> it's this nanotech. I mean, so, what about Red and Blue Screamed Spider in sixty whatever, whenever he was created? Like, I don't know. <laughs> no, I think that was that. I think that was color theory at that point to to do that. Well, yeah, and now it's destiny. Um, I also really kind of love the Peter Jonah Ben relationship. I think making that a triumvirate where. Spider-Man is almost the Batman in that. I think mm. that's kind of interesting. Um, if you replace the other two with, of course, Harvey and Jim Gordon, it has that same vibe. Um, he's the one that can go out and do the grunt work. He can go out and do and investigate and figure out what's going on and then feed them information, theoretically. So I'm interested in seeing how that's going to play out, but it seems very, very obvious to me that one of those two is on the chopping block. This is going to get very real, and one of them's going to die. Yeah. What if it's a kid instead? That's way too heavy. I well, don't. I don't see that. We we floated it last time, but in relation to just like threatening, I don't know. Like killing might be too far, at least for the kid. But I can see that dynamic with the other two, and uh, somehow I'm not. I'm leaning towards. Actually, no. If we're talking about destiny, right, Ben. No, it's going to be Jonah. 
I don't know. I mean, everything else is playing out. It's panning out to some degree, you know? If it's if it's not Jonah, I'm done with this. Ah, come on. No, you're gonna I'm you're gonna are you do We've you got the this... same suit and Osborne is the goblin, and then Uncle Ben is gonna die. What are we here for? Okay, calm down. Do you think that this is a good comic book? It's fine. I found this issue again <laughs> predictable Jesus in Christ. everything that we've talked about. We've called all this stuff. I love your takes on Spider Man comics, Kale. Because the older I get, the more I start to agree with you. <laughs> and another thing, I the thing that really bugs me about Peter Parker in this, he's got way too much swagger. Nah, he's a he's, young dad, you know. Yeah, I think exactly. I think I think it, well, and I guess that's to this is to Hickman's credit. Even even if I'm not totally a fan of it, I think adult Peter has melded what we know about. He, you know, Peter's origin and then the the dichotomy between Peter Parker and Spider-Man. He's done that really well in that Spider-Man, as we know him, has become adult Peter Parker, who now has to become Spider-Man. Does that make any sense? Attitude-wise, so. personality. I got, I got a little dizzy there, but I mean – Look at his wife. I mean, he had to have at least some kind of swagger at this point. Riz, as the kids call it. You're the youngest one here, Marco. And it's probably out of uh, head play already. So. <laughs> uh, we get a the, the the big action beat here again is Green Goblin and Spider Man versus Bullseye. It's more like Green Goblin versus Bullseye with Spider Man kind of finishing things up. Um. That was awesome. Bullseye came across really badass here. Um, you know, he hangs with the Green Goblin, who we we know is a dangerous person, right? Um, but boy, oh boy, is Bullseye formidable. Like, he just doesn't give a fuck. He's been here, done that. This is all routine to him. He's going to kill them, and it's no big deal. I thought Chichetto draws a really good um, redesigned costume that looks tactical and um, realistic. You know, mm. uh, like Bullseye, I love Bullseye as a character, but him running around in spandex in this world that seems a little more realistic doesn't really make sense. So this redesign really works, and I like how it still keeps the motif of the the target on his forehead. Um, I also love that he almost exclusively uses playing cards. <laughs> oh, that was so cool, man. That was cool. I love that he has knee pads. <laughs> That's so funny. It was wild. I, I, lo I just looked at that photo and went, oh, those knee pads. I bet those are strong <laughs> as hell. <laughs> the only critique that I had for that sequence is just that I felt like Bullseye was a little bit too talky. I would have preferred his yeah. talking to be dialed down a bit. It took away from his menace just a tad. But other than that, awesome sequence. Yeah, this was uh, absolutely great. Yeah, I think this is my pick of the week. I, yeah. Looking real quickly at the other books, uh, I think this is my pick of the week. I'm with you there. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, I think just on Chichetto art alone, I just think it's yeah. really good art. Yeah. The art's crazy good. Like, if you're not buying this just off art, you're missing out. There's also a fantastic Mike Del Mundo variant for this that I they put on uh, the stream that's essentially a uh, play on the Spider-Man No More cover, but he's just doing laundry instead. It's so good. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> That's this mess. This book has actually had quite a few like really good covers. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And not just standard spider pose covers, like covers that are just quality that feature the family, you know, out, out of costume things. How, how do you feel about the way the trade dressing works for the covers of the ultimate li ultimate line? The, the thing on the side looks a little bulky, like the mm. yeah, yeah, it looks a little bulky. Uh, I don't, I don't have, I don't really have much to say about it. It's a decision, you know, that they're making and I'm, I'm cool with it. It's, you know, it's, it's fine. I don't know if you guys noticed though, but like now that I'm actually paying attention to it, since you asked that this is all the cover, but the, the parts that are under the, the parts of the, the art that are under the trade dress are black and white, which is kind of cool. Yeah. 
But yeah, and, and, and at least for the Spider-Man ones, um, everything is right leaning in terms of the action because of the way the trade dress works. Yeah, um, which I've I've noticed, you know, having to get images for this, uh, and it's been a little frustrating, honestly. But <laughs> do you um, do do you guys think that uh, in this version he's gonna tell MJ what's going on? Because up front they were they were kind of honest about how he feels and whether or not um, uh, he needs to like, do something and and have this change. Um, may already knows does are they gonna do you guys feel like we're gonna continue to get the you know two sides of one he's the father and the superhero and not get it kind of merged and mj has just an understanding that yeah this is a thing you have to do i think that duality is intrinsic to spider-man in most in the most sense you know um the whole having a secret identity in that so I feel like they're going to continue with him not telling MJ just yet. But at the same time, he's swinging around with his young child on his shoulders. <laughs> like, he yeah. just learned how to do this. Um, I feel like he's being a horrible husband right now. <laughs> Some, something bad is going to result from all this. And I think yeah. right now, it's fun and games. He's taking his daughter. He's eating donuts. He's doing all that. And I think Hickman is playing all that up for a reason. And whenever that time comes, I don't think it's going to involve the death of his daughter, but I do think she's going to potentially being be exposed to something that is going to cause, and, and on top of that, someone is going to die, and MJ is going to have to look at Peter differently, and it's going to cause drama. You know, right now their relationship is, is not interesting, but it will get interesting, and the drama's coming. I think, you know, I've seen criticism of this book moving too slowly. I mean, what the hell do you, what do you want? What, like, what What do you want to happen? Do you want him to accelerate things just to get to the action, just to get to reveals? I mean, this is a story. I don't understand what it is that people expect. And he's doing all the things you need, I would imagine, in a book too, right? You, you got the action here. You have the individual character building. You have some of the stuff playing, different threads playing in the background. Like, um, this has been an incredible pace frankly i agree i agree kale you a pull or a pass on this i think i'm a pull ultimately so to speak yeah good good pun <laughs> <laughs> let's let's hit a couple of listener comments listeners have been uh, you guys have been active in the chat thank you for that always appreciate the engagement uh let's see I have one from Dan that I wanted to Shoot. bring up. Uh, Dan said, uh, I hate anything about destiny in a Spider-Man story. It's supposed to be about choices. Mm. The mm. choice not to stop the robber that ultimately killed Uncle Ben. Though no, the destiny of Peter being the one that gets his bitten by the spider. Well, then destiny comes into play when you start bringing in you know, the whole great web and stuff. And I'm like, all right, that's where I check out a Spider-Man <laughs> I'm not a fan of the great web stuff. And I think the destiny aspect of Spider-Man is way overplayed in main, you know, in um, 616. But literally, the story told us this is his destiny in Ultimate. That is the story. Mm -hmm. So it's really not a matter of even like this being a carryover of mainline 616. It's just that literally Peter's meant to be Spider-Man. Someone intervened which is the same truth for lots of other heroes. Spider-Man is not the only one for whom his destiny was taken. It's just that ultimate Spider-Man focuses on Spider-Man. So, uh, Atomic Count said, the costume scene is an influence from the movies that doesn't happen 30 years ago. Not saying one is better than the other. An influence from the movies, how? I'm not sure what you mean by that. Yeah, I feel like yeah. they're just kind of like testing stuff out. Maybe the the first Toby Maguire one, you know, where he's drawing the the scene, oh. the ones in his notebook. Okay, my guess. Yeah, well, it's also just cool to see different spider suits. Yeah, it's good fun, you know. And I also think what Tyler said, where Hickman was, Hickman and Marco were having fun with yeah. showing off these different like variations on classic costumes. Um, 
because we're not going to see them. You know, yeah. like there's likely not going to be a, a Ben Riley um, because that would just be crazy and doesn't seem like the kind of thing Hickman wants to involve him, himself with. So, so far. Yeah, right. Uh, Atomic Hound said, also said, I'm old and thought this was unpredictable, probably my fading mental capacity. For me, predictability in storytelling is not a sin. I don't think that there's anything wrong with predictability if it's if it's the right thing for the story. Like, there have been tons of theories floated about who the Green Goblin would be. And maybe there's a world where Uncle Ben being the Green Goblin makes sense. And a different creative team tells that story. But it's not what makes sense for this story. And what makes sense for this story is the predictability of it being Harry. Now, if we want six issues with the question hanging over us and then it ultimately is Harry, that's bad predictability because we snuffed that out in issue one. But getting it out the way, saying there's no mystery to this, it's not about the mystery, I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. It's about the friendship. And, and I think it's better to be, you know, like in my case, I think it's better to be slightly disappointed about that now so that Hickman can pull the rug or whatever he's going to do later on. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Tom Account says they would never have spent that many panels on a costume choice. Well, welcome to uh, decompressed storytelling, bud. <laughs> <laughs> it's the new world we're in. By the way, by the way, Thank you to everybody who is here with us. Make sure you Hulk smash that like button. It lets YouTube know that you enjoy what we do. Uh, speaking of the Hulk, this past Tuesday, we did our Hulk Future and Perfect book club. Y'all voted. You guys voted. And that's the book that ended up winning the vote. And so we did the book club. I had a great time with it. You guys seem to have had a great time with it. We've received a lot of uh, a lot of compliments, a lot of kind words about it. So thank you to everybody that tuned in. Uh, run those numbers up on that. Let's get a few. Let's get you guys uh, watching it. I I put a lot of effort into it. I know that you will learn something you did not know about the Hulk. I'm sure of it. I am positive about that. And if I am wrong about that, and you go and listen, and you can prove me wrong, hit our mentions. Let, let me know. I don't think that that will happen. The voting goes down on Patreon, patreon.com slash the comics pals. We announced that the month of April will be Tom King month. And so nominations are happening on Patreon for free on our YouTube chip page under the community tab. Just drop the name of the Tom King book series arc, whatever that you want us to include that you want us to, uh, to review, to be the subject of our book club. And uh, we'll put it in the poll. And if it wins, that's the book we'll do. It's real simple stuff. So uh, head on over and uh, make your voice heard. Make your voice heard. Uh, the listener poll is up as well. We'll get back to that in a little bit. Let's keep the reviews going. Let's talk more comics. Let's talk Rise of the Powers of X10, whatever. Number three, written by Kieran Gillen. R.B. Silva on art. It's apropos, of course. R.B. Silva, the artist behind uh, the OG powers. David Curiel on colors. Clayton Cowles on the letters. And, you know, we're, we're rocketing towards a finale here. Professor Xavier has gone all the way back in time to when Moira was a child, as she is just about to embark on her journey away from her parents and everything else. Professor Xavier has arrived to kill her. And uh, not only is that happening, not only is Professor X trying to kill Moira, we also have the the madness unfolding with Doug, uh, Sinister Doug, if you will, and Rasputin figuring that out uh, and going back in time to say to Professor X, hey, what the fuck, <laughs> essentially. Um and it's just all that kind of stuff unfolding. I've seen a lot of negative about this book so far. A lot of people really not hot on it. I think there's good work done in this issue. I do think that. I think the opening scene has some good work in it. Professor Xavier and Moira speaking 
is essentially the most important thing that happens in House and Powers. The most important moment from both of those books is when Professor Xavier and Moira sit down to talk. Because all of this, everything that has happened since, spins out of that. So them sitting down to talk now with Professor X slumped, no longer the happy and bright professor he was when Moira approached him in that initial scene. Her now a child, the biggest threat to the mutants that has ever existed, whereas at that point she was their savior. I love all that. I think all that is very poetic and well done. My problem is that everything that's good is bogged down by everything that is bad. Literally everything else. <laughs> it immediately crumbles in the weight of its own uh, plot. It's a lot. I agree I with you, though. Wish, I wish this issue was the conversation. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yep. That I, I think, I think Sean, to what you said, I would have appreciated a conversation. Like, and... Uh, that would have made it feel that much more poetic, giving us that justice. But um, outside of those first, what, three pages, man, I, 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 I was struggling to, to follow. And uh, at some point, it's like my mind would wander. I'd have to come back to this. Like the, there was just it was dense for the sake of being dense and wrapping up so many plot points. I think at another point in the Krakone era, this would have been, this whole issue would have been the conversation. Maybe yeah. cut away to Rasputin fighting Sentinels just so you have some breaks in speed of what's going on. And then like the end ends with him on the trigger and you don't know what's going to happen. But like th this, this fall of X again, just feels like everything has to just wrap up. Um, I like, like reading that conversation, I'm like, all right, this feels like the Gill and X-Men that I have enjoyed. I'm I'm enjoying what's going on here. I like the fact that, you know, <laughs> Xavier is just like, he's just like reticent to the whole thing. He's like, yeah, I know this isn't what you wanted. I don't want this either. It's it's very um um uh, uh of mice and men, you know? He just has to <laughs> kill kill uh, uh is it Larry Lenny? Lenny? Lenny. Yeah, and he's like he doesn't want to, but um and and that's good. And then like A we got all this gobbledygook in the background. We have the reveal of Sinister, which felt like it was supposed to be a reveal in this. But we just read X-Men Forever last week that editorially should have come out months ago. <laughs> and it was already told, like, that's confusing. And then he just drops it. Like, he has this whole conflict of, of consciousness, Xavier. Um, and at the end, he's just like, all right, Rachel, you convinced me to go the hard route. It's not... Why? What happened? He betrays her. Sure, but that's double crossed. The, that's the hard route. That's how I read it. It's like, all right, you wanted me to go the hard way. We can do that. I don't want to. And this is part of what the hard way is. Because I think the phoenix has to come back for the hard way, and so she needs to be gone. Hmm. So why does Rachel have to be gone for the Phoenix to come back? Easy host for the isn't, Phoenix. Isn't she the Phoenix? Um, I she might currently be the Phoenix actually. I don't know who the Phoenix is right now. I thought Which, it was Echo. Yeah. Oh yeah, true. Oh. <laughs> Last time I was aware it was Echo. Yeah, I I read it as like, all right, I got to get one of the easy hosts off the board because I need to harness this Phoenix energy. You asked for it, Rachel. Sorry, but like just him mm. choosing that so quickly, it's like, all right, then what the hell was his first? You know, two thirds of this book. Mm, like it was a hard pivot for it was off too hard of very pivot. little. Yeah, yeah, off of like a little information. Hmm. Even the pivot of like letting Doug Sinister get killed. Like I get it because it's still Sinister and let him get killed. But it's like, all right, then why did you do that? Reveal at the beginning, like just pacing wise, it just feels so off. This issue. The problem is that. I don't think any of this is like Professor Xavier doesn't kill kids. And if he's thinking about killing a kid, then there is no pivoting from that. And if he wanted it to happen, then it happens. What is this conversation? If that's what has to happen, what is the point of this conversation? He, he's not wrestling with it. 
So because he's not wrestling with it, if it's absolute, then there shouldn't be any question marks. If he's wrestling with it and Moira's narrative is swaying him on some level, then it makes sense to me that when Rasputin comes, he's like, okay, you know what? I'm wrong. I see that I'm wrong. But there's no reason why he should see that he's wrong because nothing changed. No one swayed him. He would never yeah. be holding up a gun to a child unless that was the only option, not even if there was a hard route. You know, he would have taken that already, I feel. The easy way out is is killing Moira, is killing a kid. Like, the, I don't know. The, the framing of that is strange to me. I, I sort of also extrapolated, like, a metaphor of that where we don't want the editorial erasure of Krakoa because because yeah. th- there's there's the moment of we you know we're trying to get you know we, we don't want to remove it you know it did happen it was a uh, an existence and um i thought that that was the route that they started going and then that pivot was more so from that perspective less related to the story and i thought that that was too tongue in cheek that's an interesting take on it i i don't i don't dislike that but then, but but then, I don't like that. That's the direction you would take it. You know, like then you're sacrificing this this story for want not wanting to erase it, this history when it felt like that's what you were going to do anyway, and you are doing that anyway. They're not erasing. What do you? They're what do you mean? They're erasing the history? Well, they're they're resetting, right? Like we're going to be resetting to this newer, different X Men. It's not a. Re- there's there is no reset. I Everything think, that's coming follows this timeline. Well, I think they're this, not going to go ahead. The story is positing that Xavier wants to kill Moira so that he can it can make a new life, and then Krakoa doesn't exist, and then none of the mess happened. Right. Um, so, following your example, that would be the full, the full reset. Right. Yeah. But I think that's part of my problem is that they're not doing that. And they're very obviously not going to do that. So if Professor X is going to pull a gun out on a kid, I don't give a damn what kid it is. If he's going to do that, and then he's not going to kill that kid, then I I, I have a problem. We already know he's not pulling that trigger. From the moment... Go ahead. He's got to live with the fact that he's pulled a gun on a kid and (laughs) had to, like, think about it. And then just didn't do it. Yeah, yeah, which is worse and it's a it's a look i i've said it multiple times i think the characterization of professor xavier post hickman has been abominable and i what it shows me is that there is a perspective on xavier that he is a piece of shit that writers push forward for no good reason other than just to to further that professor xavier is not a bad guy like he's not a villain they make him seem like he is sinister or Orcus or whoever, and that's not the case. So when things like this happen, they feel, for me, wildly out of character. And now this is a part of canon. He pulled a gun on a kid. And everybody thinks he's a piece of shit. Somebody else is going to retcon and say, well, it wasn't a gun. It was a time displacement. It was like, <laughs> it was like the gun that killed Batman. I, I, I mean, is it, you know, not even it's he didn't do anything so who cares like well then in that example rachel didn't get time explain uh displaced well i was gonna say if that if in that case i could just hold a, a gun up to people anyway and, and you know and I, I didn't shoot it's no big deal so wow. <laughs> so in in the in the future if you will moira is dealing with an enigma you know Enigma being a, a, one of sinister, one of sinister's clones who became a Dominion, and he's essentially saying, "Hey, I have control. I'm outside of time, but in order to get access to your timeline, we have to team up." And I think what I got out of it, and and you guys, you know, let me know if you felt differently. I think what happens is that at some point she becomes aware of the conversation that she had with Xavier. Did you guys get that? Yeah. I don't think so. No? That's how I I don't think so. I I read it because right when Xavier tells Moira the stuff before he, like, doesn't kill her and he leaves, there's, like, an effect on her. 
Yeah. And then we jump right to Moira. So I, I, I think the jump is like it's supposed to infer correlation. Right. See, I, th- I, th- I read that as the Enigma power activated. Mm, like she she went through with it yeah interesting yeah. where does both actually if that makes sense well I, yeah that very well could be but um, okay because i i don't think that her conversation with xavier would affect her this way you know, she wouldn't all of a sudden see galaxies in her eyes and, you know. Um, sure. You uh, know. It, 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 I, I thought it was coming out of that conversation page where it was the Enigma to, to Moira where, you know, her whole thing is survivability and her lasting and yeah. her realizing that, yes, even though, you know, I will get, uh, I'll be brought into the Dominion, I want my own body, and it's like, well, you don't, you don't have to worry about that. You will have some version of, what does he say? He says some sub, uh, subroutine, some subroutine, right? And that felt like maybe too little for her. That's what I thought changed her mind. It was just like, wait, hold on a second. Like I'm, I need more. You can't just erase who I am and my being. Sure, I'll be, I'll, I'll be absorbed and be the dominion, but I want my own autonomy. And if I'm just a subroutine, if I'm just something under that, I don't like that. Well, I read that as him giving her her own autonomy, that there yeah, is not no. part of the whole, that she can still operate separate. Yeah, he says, I'm offering you to be an exception. You will be a fully independent subroutine, a fully independent subroutine in my endless engine. Mm. And speaking of the, the page in which they're having that conversation, I am so ready to be gone, done and dusted with these pay these kinds of pages at least this one was like like i had to force myself to do it but at yeah. least it was interesting that first one was like come on why are we still doing this like you thought this was interesting this text thread between moira and the enigma enigma well there's there's meat there you know what i mean like this conversation i i don't think could have played out on a normal page Dude, I, I forgot but about that first page. I think it's I think it's stuff we needed. Yeah, for context. But again, it's a massive text page that I did have to force myself to read. I I think like that's like at least with the first graphic. I, again, I didn't read that either. It made no sense to me in terms of information flow. Yeah. Um that had to be portrayed in that way. I feel like this text one could have been per- portrayed portrayed as a comic, you know. <laughs> they were talking previously. Why I do agree. we just need a text thread here? It almost seems like, all right, we're going to skip out on a page. Like if I, I wanted to read a boring text thread, I'd read my dating app messages. Like it's uh, just, I think there's good. just too much here. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. too much, too much personality coming from dominion and too much oh, back and true. forth and going between them. And that's why I think for space, this had to be this. The first one I think exists. Well, I don't know. All it did for me was remind me that this Omega Sentinel actually is not like she's from the she has data from the future. From a time at which a I believe at which a Dominion was became such and she gets that information about what happened programmed into her and then that programming goes back to a past body, something of that something of that nature. Yeah. That happened in 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 uh, the original Rise, right? Or, or I or original think so. I, I yeah, I believe so. Um, and that's all it did for me was remind me of that fact. But the presentation of that is uh, abominable. Uh, and I just I feel like it was done a lot elegantly at an earlier point. It'll make a lick of sense. Yeah. Um. You know the art's good. RB Silva doing his thing. I still love his his uh, his. Uh, Rasputin, you know, his Rasputin always looks awesome. The Sentinels, the you know, the, the HK Sentinels invading and her kicking their asses was really cool. Um, you know, and then even the coloring, the David Curiel colors during the sequence where Professor X is threatening Moira, you yeah. know, all the, the purples and oranges and everything else, all that stuff looks awesome too, which is a motif of 
um, of this era of, of X-Men, but specifically powers. Mm. Yeah, that stuff is good. The the pinks in, in particular continue to go through, especially with Enigma. Yeah. I mean, like, so that was interesting. What did you guys think about this wild um this wild page with um uh, Rasputin? where Rasputin kills Sinister? I feel like that like the the style, you know, with the um the you know the moment echo or whatever, you know, yeah. in the background here. I feel like that came out of nowhere. That it, Not if that it was it's kind bad, of like, certainly, but if it was kind of manga, yeah, I I, I, I can see that kind of like you you, know, you slice in it cuts to black and white and, and like a flash type thing. It was dramatic for sure. Yeah. I liked it. I was cool with it. It was all right. You know, it was it was dramatic. It it it, it gave it it gave the moment some emphasis, which I liked. Mm -hmm. Um and I'm happy that Rasputin was the one that killed Sinister. I thought that mm -hmm. was appropriate. Um but for me, the moment was undercut by the fact that Professor X just gambled it all on going back in time to kill a kid and working with Sinister again. And then when Rasputin's like, yeah, do you really want to do this? And he's like, ah, nah, go ahead, kill the guy. <laughs> well, it was also it was also a moment yeah. of like R Ramsey kind of just like he turns around. He has like the, the diamond and it's like, oh, no, it's, you know, it's Sinister. Uh, and then it's like, by the way, you played into his plan. And he changes of just like, well, actually, I don't think I was ever going to do it. I don't know. Is Sinister like, the biggest villain of the Krakoan era? Yes. My uh, biggest villain right now. I think the biggest villain of the Krakoan era is editorial, but. <laughs> <laughs> and also, why did his diamond come out? It's like when what? Sonic the Hedgehog dies. <laughs> the rings. Wait, what do you mean? No, like his diamond appears on his head when when he turns to speak with Rasputin. Right. Why did that have to happen? The bangs parted. <laughs> I'm but not like, even joking. Yeah. Yo, I think but, he's but actually, literally no. though, other other characters have had diamonds on their heads that were concealed. So and and so did he. Otherwise, everyone would have known that he was a, a, a sinister. I literally thought it was just his hair moved and it was a slip. I think, <laughs> yeah, I think it's just to show that he, you know, is revealed. But Where? but 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 I'm saying like Rasputin doesn't know that unless his diamond comes out. Blue spaceman is saying because he used his sinister powers. I'm not entirely sure I understand what sinister powers are. <laughs> Marvel knows what Sinister yeah, powers like are. Yeah, the, the, the fail-safe, the untouchable. I don't uh, know what that was about. A lot of questions of this issue. Yeah. This is my favorite issue of the three, though. Actually, maybe my favorite issue of this section of X-Men. Of powers and rise. Yeah, 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 yeah. Those two. Or fall and rise, yeah. Like, was it just the reveal of Sinister? Was that just so that... Xavier would be cool with Rasputin killing her later, or that that would be the reason she would go stop him, stop so, Xavier. So Blue Space Man said that maybe it was because he used his sinister powers. You know, okay, maybe, but to, like to do whatever with the tendrils and the the sentinels and stuff. Exactly. Yeah. yeah exactly. But my thing is that in universe. Doug Sinister is aware that this would be a problem. Yeah. So if you know that when you use your powers, you're, there's a red diamond on your head and that that would tell Rasputin who you are, maybe you would go out of your way to conceal that by, I don't know, not turning your fucking head. <laughs> like, it's just like, that's such a, that's so yeah, easy. Wear a hat. <laughs> Uh, I, I yeah, know. the only thing I can make it make sense of is like it it stops the Sentinel and then it causes Rasputin to go stop Xavier. Right. Like that's the only thing that makes sense to me. Like it doesn't make sense that – yeah, it doesn't make sense that he would do that. Uh, On quality, I would say pull. 
but only if you are really committed. Like I'm committed. I'm writing this out. So are we just as a, as a podcast, but as an individual person that doesn't have a podcast, if you're not committed to this, there are other things you can do with your money and time. I enjoyed it for the most part. I actually read this issue twice, um, which I rarely ever do, but that was because I didn't want to come in and shit on it. I'm tired of doing that. So I was like, let me really dig in and see if I can, you know, and so I don't hate it. I actually enjoyed it. I'm saying pull. But if you don't need to read this, do not. Yeah, if you don't need to read this, there's Ultimate X-Men. There's X-Men 97, number one, that just came out. And we got a whole new <laughs> X-Men coming in, in June. So I have that one ready on. so I can read. be honest, we're going to get there. But even X-Force, it's the last issue of X-Force. And it was easier to understand than this. Sure. <laughs> like. Absolutely. Par for the course. I mean, get Kieran Gillen. You know, that's uh, that's kind of how that goes. Atomic Count says, why do I still... Th- oh, I'm sorry. Before we get to the comments, poll pass? Uh, personal pass. Pass, yeah. It's a pass for me. Fair enough. Atomic Count says, why do I still think I'm going to need to do a binge read of the Krakoan era? Um, I think that if you have been... Like, a person who listens to this podcast or follows another podcast or catches up through Twitter or whatever, will be okay. You know enough, I think, to go into this next generation. Um, I don't think you're going to need to do much reading of the Krakoan Arrow, to be honest. I think Marvel very, very much wants it to be as close to a clean slate as they can get. So... Uh, promiscuous time traveler wants a Marco minute. Listen, uh, no, no, that's not going to be happening today. I think most Dang. of us have, are having Marco minutes right now. I think we're all equally confused. <laughs> <laughs> not yet, not yet. O- only on good books. I can't even imagine what Marco would waste his minute on <laughs> this week. Marowak Oscuro says, instead of killing her, he should have just made her forget the idea. I oh, don't damn. think this is Xavier. I think it is Xavier, but that is a that makes that and that's that's the thing, right? Like you see a guy who you know has the ability to make a person not know anything, right? Like shut them down, shut their mind down, right? Make her think she's Vanessa Swanson, okay? Whatever. He can do anything he wants to do. That's a random person kill. Okay, he can do okay. anything he wants to do. So he brings a gun. Right. <laughs> this well, guy has, he's the most powerful telepath in the world. And he's got a gun. <laughs> he's, no, he's, he's more ready powerful. To use Not it. to defend this book, but I think it's because Moira has to die for the reality mutant power to regenerate reality again. I don't think just sure. forgetting yeah, Krakoa yeah, would be enough. I get that. But if she forgets you know her her this previous life and then they don't have to go through all this but i think it's branch doesn't have to it's it would still happen though like their their timeline still continues even though she forgot because but but there's a there's a limit to the number of lives that she can go back on this would have been the last life um and remember even at even at the beginning it was questioned as to whether or not this was her last life so presumably, let's say she had one more, she forgets it. That's fine. She goes through the first experience and whatever dies tragically or something. It's also, I would also say, it's unlikely that the exact same things would happen. You know. Oh, uh, quick shout out to Atomic Hound. He says, uh, "Going to take forty nine ninety nine super chat to get a Marco's minute tonight. Make it happen, people." I think it's more of a hey, 69 if it's Marco. For that, you can have it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for, for that type of super chat, you can have whatever you want for a minute. Um, Blue Spaceman says, mind screws could also come off. So. Also true. Also true. I just, I don't know. I don't know. We've talked We've talked about Shooting a kid is cooler, I guess. Yeah, I, I guess. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Izzy's issue says, I'm with you, Atomic Hound, but I'm waiting to binge read until Sean shows off the Stakoa. Oh my God. Oh, the Stakoa, dude. When we do X-Men month, 
I am going to, at the request of the one and only Atomic Hound, I am going to present my Stakoa to the people. <laughs> and I have been working to get all of my Krakoan era X-Men books in one place. And this is a fucking gargantuan task. I am not joking about that. It is not hyperbole. It has been five years, guys. Yep. A Krakoan a Krakoa size stack. It's been Krakoa. five years. And I have a large majority of what they have released. Not literally every single book, but very close to every single book. So it's going to be something. It's, I don't even know. I, I was thinking the other day, how am I going to even show this? Like, I, I don't even understand how I'm going to show it. It's too uh, much. I've actually thought of or organizing it into an Excel so that way you can like break down by different categories. I've Third. thought about this. Yeah. I thought, I thought about him stacking it into a chair formation, like Game of Thrones style. <laughs> <laughs> it's into the Christmas tree behind. Uh, it's just that it'll stay there for the rest of the year. Hmm. Probably oh. build a Christmas tree out of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, my girlfriend ain't having that. Um, thanks to everybody for hanging out with us so far. We've got quite a few more books to go. Make sure you Hulk smash that like button if you're enjoying the show. Super chats are open. Uh, and you can also join our YouTube channel by hitting uh, the join button and becoming a channel member. You get access to early access to some videos. You get emojis in the chat. Join the army today if you are so inclined. The army, the pals army, the army of pals. Oh, thank First. God. Don't join the real army. No, I, I wouldn't uh I wouldn't encourage that as much. Um let's talk about X Force number 50. I wanted to make sure we got to this because it's the finale issue. How can we be a podcast that reviews the Krakoan era if we're not reviewing the finales, right? Ben Percy on the words with art by Robert Gill, Guru EFX on colors, and Joe Caramagna on the letters. This is as straightforward as it comes. It's beast on beast action. Oh. X Force is trying to stop one beast who's trying to stop another beast who's trying to get rid of all the mutants so that he can stop the humans and then bring the mutants back. You follow me? You smell what I'm cooking. To be fair, it's a very straightforward comic. <laughs> yeah, so somehow it's more clear than most of the Krakoan era. The whole black hole thing and being able to just create one that only targets mutants. I, I had a little bit of a question about that, but I yeah. it's the be it's beast. I trusted him. I was like, all right, I'm pretty sure this guy knows what he's doing. Well, and luckily enough, like we don't have to worry about it. So Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I love the addition of Power Man uh, or sorry, uh, uh Wonder Man in this. Uh, and I love how they're sticking with him being a pacifist. Like it's, I would I would assume they would have gotten rid of that by now, but he is still doing it. Yeah, you know, I had a lot of fun with this issue, despite the fact that I think it's a little weird, uh, and there are some definite contrivances. Uh, mm. uh, one one example for me that really stuck out like it's a sore thumb beyond what Tyler pointed out about this crazy black hole gun is that uh, the only reason why Beast doesn't go through with his plan is because of Wonder Man. Yep. Which I don't believe for a single solitary second at all. Hey, bro is before black holes, apparently. <laughs> wow. That that doesn't pass the smell test. Beast has done way too many things to yeah. people he loves for him to stop himself due to Wonder Man. Nah. There was so that the the ending of this, like this book is like moving, it's moving, it's moving, it's moving. And it ends and it ends. Like um yeah. the I, again, like I, I know like that we knew that you know, this is issue fifty, so I gotta assume that they knew the end was near and this would be the end of it. But like this pacing wise, this one also kind of just halts, like it screeches to a halt and it's done in the most like just that storyline with Beast, right? He, he blows up. That is like him blowing up is the end of what we see for that story. Uh -huh. And then it goes into like the most like cookie cutter, like, and that's why we're the X-Force. <laughs> titles, it, like title. Yeah, it, it felt rushed as well, you know, like. <laughs> Uh, I, I mean, I thought, not, not to say it was bad. I think it was a fine comic, but it definitely felt rushed by the end there. And I haven't, 
you know, I'm I'm not familiar with Beast uh, in the comics as much, and th these interactions, man, were goofy. Um, there's the moment where the Magneto was right, and from years from now they'll say the same of Beast. He pulls the thing down, and they start wrestling. He's like. Uh, there's still good in you. Your version of good is moral, an embarrassing construct, a simpleton's way of considering the world. Like, what the fuck? Dude, Marco, what you... uh, I introduce you to Hank McCoy. <laughs> Bro, my version is cold and quantitative. Oh, that's Beast. Damn, Sounds like Marco. Don't, don't like that, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yes, just reading his uh, daily conversation in the mirror. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like that's sort of just beast. Um, maybe, maybe you could, you could certainly quibble about some of the lines of dialogue, but I, I enjoy Ben Percy's, uh, good beast and bad beast. Um, I feel like he has a handle on the character, which he better after 50 issues. Um, I look beast for me is one of the characters who, I'm a Beast lover. I have loved Beast since I was a child. I have no problems with what they did with Beast in the Krakoan era. Don't clip that. None at all. Because this is character growth. Like, he evolved and changed in a meaningful way that makes sense for who the character is as he's been presented for at least about 30 years. Yep. So I'm I'm with it. And and the seeds of all this were planted well before Hickman too. Yes. Um, you know, like there there was the the dark beast that was you know the in the alternate dimension or whatever. But then I mean you know even even beast going into the past of his own volition to get the original five X Men to the future, you know, and completely risking the you know the space time continuum or whatever the fuck like. My man has been teetering for decades. <laughs> like, yeah, dude, go he... back to Messiah Complex. Sure. This this man this man was literally desperate for a cure. He was willing to do anything, cross any line. Mm. That is Beast. Beast in Beast's mind, he is singularly charged with making sure that mutants thrive and prosper. <laughs> Self selfly charged with that. Yeah. Yeah, every iteration of the Beast that's not main 616 up until now was a dark version of him. Even the Bendis one where he goes into to, to pull the young ones back. Remember the, forward, the the future Beast that comes up as well? And they were actually the Brotherhood of Mutants the entire time? Right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. There's not there's not many good uh, uh, multiversal Beasts out there. He's a good person. He's just dr driven in a way that always leads to this and it sucks, but that's just his, his destiny, I guess. Um, I really appreciated, I, I read uh, 49 and 50 back to back. So hopefully this is a part of this issue, but actually it might not be, but Wolverine has a lot of um, worries about how to handle this because beast is one of his best friends. Um, mm -hmm. And so there was some, some solid character work with that, um, I and I guess it was in the last issue. This one doesn't get to do as much character work with the rest of X Force outside of Beast, frankly. Um, uh, but I still enjoy what we got, and maybe that's just because I've been on it. But I, I, I feel like this has been this is this is good. This is my pick of the week. I had a, I had a really wow. great time with this. Um, oh. I was I was captivated by the conflict. Um, this is the type of story that i'm fascinated by you know if you could speak to a younger version of yourself and be presented with the choices you uh made you know what would happen what would you do how would you do things different the that that's a story that i'm completely um it, it keeps me awake at night and um just watching this unfold Granted, you know, getting to the the end where it falls off a a cliff, you know, Wiley e. Coyote style, like I, you know, that that bugged me. But at the same time, it's like, well, a lot happened here, sure. and um, yeah, I I had a great time, and and you know, I we we keep talking about it. 
that beast has been teetering and there have been multiple evil beasts and whatever, but like this is kind of my first one that we've like really lived with. And I just wanted to see it through, you know, mm. and I'm not disappointed. I, you know, I, I, I think you're right, Sean, with uh, your point about how Wonder Man is what um, made him uh, save the world or whatever. But it was also a bit like, you know, Percy seeded some of that at the beginning of the issue. So I yeah, well, I'll forgive it a little. It is corny, but uh, you had to end it. I just, I almost wish that he could have just been convinced he was wrong yeah. by his younger version. Yeah, I agree. Um, I don't know. Maybe Percy felt he didn't have time for that, or that wasn't a bombastic enough ending. But I think, and and especially for a book titled X Force. But I honest, I honestly think it's kind of apropos that a book titled X Force would end like that. Um, because Beast is really the star of this book, and he's the star of this this actual comic. And there is a great scene of dialogue between beasts. So I feel like that could have been the resolution. Um, but then what do you do with two beasts? So I, I, I don't know. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, and I wonder, I wonder if it wouldn't quite have been clear enough. Mm. You know, maybe at the end, he, we, Percy felt like we needed that visual reminder of like, this is what this is. This is why he's doing it. But in a, in a weird, crazy way, and I guess we're used to all this now because of how Krakoa has functioned, but this is the end of the life of the beast we've been following for forever. Like, this is the end of his life. Yep. I I, I, I would have thought they, you know, you keep him to end up becoming just Dark Beast, and now, you know, you kind of just stick with this nice beast moving forward. Sorry, what do you mean? Like uh, in the past, you've had Dark Beast where he's just outright like an evil beast from another universe. So like, I would have thought uh, the end of this would have been he gets ousted from X-Force because he is so evil, kind of just is now potential antagonist. And um, we stick around with the good beast. And let the Dark Beast be another just character out yeah there. just out there he's like he's impending you know that kind of stuff i thought that'd be cool or fun for uh, a potential future storyline yeah i i could definitely see that too and i think that's been done no oh, it's been done but i i'm just saying like rather than outright get rid of the character i think keeping the two beasts would have been a little bit more interesting sure um especially given how this issue ends Fair enough. Uh and and the art's real good. Um yeah, the art's good. Gil's been on this book for a while. He's not the OG artist, but he's been on here for some time and uh I think he does really good work. I like the uh I like the the bio suit that Beast has. I, I enjoy that design. I think it's kind of cool. We've seen it a lot. Um and uh, you know he gets to do some some cool things with the various X Force members. I do wish they they were used a little bit more, even visually. But like seeing them tear up the uh, the Sentinels, which are just jobbers now, um, that was cool. I like Omega Red being here and getting his licks in. There were some fun beats and and, and good visuals. Okay. Sean, have you have you read every issue of this? No, not you every back single in when one. we jumped back in, right? Yeah, because okay. mm -hmm. I feel like we never got a full at least I haven't read it yet, possibly. So I might be wrong, but a full conclusion to the whole um, rest, uh, the the Colossus stuff. That wasn't addressed here, but I could I might have just not gotten to that part yet. So, yeah, I'm pretty confident that that was resolved here in the, the core, the core X-Force. Yeah, pull. Take of the week. It's a pull for me. Yeah, pull. Awesome. Let's talk. Let's get into DC land and let's talk primer. Primer number one. Now, this is so first of all, this is written by Jennifer Morrow uh, and Thomas Krzyzewski with art by Gretoluski. 
Uh, they actually put those details on the cover, which is uh, not that common, like the full names of the creators. Uh, letters by Wes Abbott as well. So Primer is a young adult book, you know, kid book um, that was released initially in graphic novel format, like full young adult graphic novel format. And it did incredibly well. Primer routinely outsells most if most of DC's biggest books and Marvel's as well in the graphic novel space. Uh, I think the only thing that outsold it was the Dark Knight. I, I believe it was the Dark Knight Returns uh, that outsells it. Um, but it does incredibly, incredibly well. And they are now reprinting this book in individual issues. And then there's going to be a sequel that comes out a little bit later. So this first issue introduces us to, you know, the main character, the primer. I'm assuming that's going to be her, uh, her uh, superhero name. Um, but she's just a kid. She's just a, she's just a kid uh, named Ashley. And the opening issues give us a glimpse into her superhero life. But a majority of the book is her origin as a, you know, um, some kind of a foster kid. And she lives in a group home and she's really feisty. So she has problems getting uh, adopted. And and she's kind of a troublemaker. She's almost trying to give these people a reason to send her back to prove herself right, which is a very common, you know, well-worn trope. Not that it's not welcome here, but then she finds the, 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 the would-be fosters who you know, meet her energy. They, they're her, they match her flame, if you will, at least, at least the dad does. Um, and, and it's, and it's hijinks and fun from there. It's a really, I thought this was really, really good. Actually, I thought it was good, but I also think it is not for me, which obviously it isn't. Um, but a little bit of me was like, all right, this is Billy Batson. You know, this is modern Billy Batson in a way. You know the the foster home story, bit of a bit of a ruffian, and then you know yeah. finds a good family, found family trope, uh, gets superhero powers, and I assume that's where this is going. Um, I thought it was fine. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I think the the biggest piece of this that I and it's not even a criticism. Um, it was paced pretty quick, but I think the nature of the demographic you're hitting. Uh, that makes sense. You want to be able to kind of get into the story, have very simple page layouts. Um, uh, the the text here is, it, it does what it needs to do. It's it's a, it's effective and um, efficient. And for the sake of, you know, a YA comic, I think it does good stuff. The art's great. The colors are good. It's engaging. Otherwise, it's fun. Yeah, I I I don't know. I, I tried to approach this from the mentality of, you know, this is for kids. This is for this is YA. And what is all the rage about? And I can definitely see what it is that makes this so popular. Um, this is a character that is probably very relatable to kids. And who wouldn't want a dad like this, right? And who can't relate to feeling like, you know, your mom or your dad is a ball buster, you know, um, and wanting to run away. You know, like, I just feel like a lot of this here is relatable and I can see why it works. It functions really, really well as a comic. It hits all the beats that it's supposed to. Um, technically, it's very well done. The art, the art is really good. Um, you know, Primer's got a simple but you know, kind of cutesy character design. There's not a lot to her costume or anything like that. Um, she doesn't really even have a costume yet. She has a wig, and, you know, and shorts and paint all over her. Um, but it all works. Yeah, She's the primer. Her costume's the primer. It's the blank coat of paint you put on first when you put on all the other colors. I, I took that as she is that until she gets the paint on her. And I, I like that they described the... Um, they they took a moment to kind of just like very intuitively describe the powers. Oh, she has the red. It has the fire. It has the whatever else. Um, and it, it's easy enough to to make sense of that, you know. Except none of them had flying, but she was flying. So that was like, uh, what? 
I took that as just like strength. Like she was just like jumping, catches it, and then whatever it might be, right? But Hmm. yeah, I found the the writing in this very um, modern. Yeah. uh, But very clear. Um, And not like not like modern in the way that I wouldn't understand it. You know. Hmm. Um, and I think that goes, I think that goes along with the pacing too. Like it's really easy to read along with these really big panels that really express the art and it really just keeps everything moving. Yeah. Totally agree. I I do think it's hilarious though, that this comic book is a Y, I mean, it's, it's a YA book. And it's three ninety nine. You can literally buy the entire first graphic novel for like ten bucks. Uh-huh. Yeah. But when this all when this all nets out, it's gonna be what four, eight, twelve. It's gonna be sixteen dollars. Uh, I I ended up getting the full graphic novel because on Kindle, the if you have Comicsology, which for some reason I still have, uh. Oh, actually- me too. Fuck. I was gonna say the same <laughs> thing, Marco. Bro, we got. <laughs> hey, we got. We're adding that to the stack. Yo. Don't even think. Word <laughs> every month, every week, break That's it out right. by charge. It, it, <laughs> but it comes out to six bucks, like six and fifteen cents. Wild, ridiculous. Yeah, I was hoping because because uh, I did the same thing, Marco. I was hoping, I'm like, I hope issue one is just part chapter one of this book. I don't want to read too much. Yeah, yeah, and then I was worried. I'm like, oh no, did I did I not read enough? I thought for a second, I'm like, we do we have to read the, the the whole thing? I'm like, fuck. And I still had Amazon um, credit too from like digital credit that you get. Yeah. We often get questions in the Discord about like, oh, you know, what would be a good, like, what would be a good comic for the for a kid or you know, like stuff like that. And I feel like you could very easily hand this to a young person in your life who has a, a, you know, passing interest in comics. And I think that they can connect with this. I think that they can understand this. And, you know, there's no barrier to entry. So for me, this is a total home run. Um, No, this isn't like, yes, this is, this is for kids. This is not for me. Right. I, but my job here is to review it. And I feel like this is very good. For the for pull. the audience, this is very good. Pull. Yeah. Pull. Yeah, easy pull. And recommend. Yes. I think this is a this is yeah. a pull and also giftable, highly giftable. Yep. Yeah. Except for us yep. who bought it digitally. <laughs> and and I hate to say it, but if I'm gifting this, I'm not gifting the, I'm not gifting this, right? I'm not gifting this floppy. I'm yeah. gifting the 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 version I can get for ten bucks. You know, the full story. And that's yeah. something that DC has to think about and reckon with. You can't sell kids four dollar comics. Sorry, not happening. I I wouldn't. I wonder if you can't sell kids based on attention, uh, single issues, like the story has to be consumable right there and then. And I wonder if there, that's an advantage to this as well. Is it's collected already? They're coming back to it and reprinting it. What issues one through four not necessarily for us because it exists out there the the wednesday warrior might pick this up you know what i mean if at all but like that's that's the target if you break it out by issue i understand what you're saying but i feel like this is so obviously not targeted at the individuals who purchase comics in the direct market that I don't even understand why you would just, why you would bother reprinting this if it's not to try to get young people to read it. I almost think it feels like it's being printed to get speculators to buy it. So it's the first appearance in comics of these characters that might be popular going forward. First in comics appearance on a CGC label somewhere. Sure. Well, either way, uh, if you've got a kid in your life and you want to get them into comics, I think this is a very good place to start. Absolutely. Does it? Uh, is there an age on the uh, on the cover or anything? It's kind of uh, a YA. We said it says ages eight and up. 
Aiden up. Yeah, totally. Yeah, so very fair. Um, Michael Hughes says, reminds me of the Minx, the defunct DC imprint. Now, I don't know about that. But uh, I I haven't heard of that. Have have I, I any of you guys heard of that? So, okay. Well, uh, Michael Hugh, that's a that's a good name based on the book we are discussing. And uh, also, I haven't seen your name in the chat before, so welcome if you're new. Uh, thanks for hanging out with us. I just googled it. Uh, Minx was 2007 2008 uh, imprint for young girls. So oh, huh? Mm-hmm. Didn't know about that. Yeah. They, they and they recently had uh what was the a recent publisher well, i know they had an initiative recently just on wanting to get kids back into it into um what is it the uh, under uh like selena they also had the um, oh, the, um the gabriel book. piccolo, piccolo yeah. yeah 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 all that stuff so Dan Trudeau says, I think it's because it's been invisible to fans who buy floppies from a store and they want to get some sales from them too. Just don't know what adults are really buying this, but well, and for their kids, hopefully, hopefully. All right, let's talk about the listener pick winner this week, which of course you can always vote in the listener pick poll on youtube.com slash the comics pals under the community tab. Batman Dark Age. Book one, written by Mark Russell, with art by Mike Allred, and colors by Laura Allred, with letters by Dave Sharp. This is the book, by the way, that won the poll, which had the most votes in the history of the poll to this point. And I have some things to say about that a little bit later. Ah, damn. Now, poll. this is a book, this, this, this book looks like... It's about, you know, Batman fighting fighting crime in a, you know, a very typical scenario. And a few pages in, it threw me for a loop. Because I did not realize that the concept here was that Bruce is reflecting on his past as an old man who is suffering from, you know, uh, uh, dementia or, you know, he's losing his his memories and he's given a book to, in which to write down his memories. And I think that's a very, very interesting twist and I didn't see that coming. Everything that follows that is foreign. This is a completely different uh, depiction of Bruce other than the fact that Alfred is in the picture. And I think it stems from the 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 fact that he is not present when his parents are killed. Right. That's huge. And then that is what changes things. And then the ending of this book was like, what? <laughs> Pardon? Um, yeah. I I love the All Reds. Um, I think the whole opening to this book. That's like welcome to the city of tomorrow. Like like having like an old you know World's Fair feel to it. Mm. Um, I thought it was great, and then I love how it's that's exactly not what Gotham is. I was like, oh, this is an interesting take on Gotham. Oh wait, it's kind of the almost a Schumacher take on Gotham. Actually, um, it's this it's just this city that was uh, tried to be part of the future and was left behind. Um, I think Russell's take on Bruce is interesting. Mm. Um, I think my, my, how I landed on this was like, I like the book. I don't know what it is. Uh, not to straight. No, nah, actually, no. Uh, the, the, the characterizations are like him being a bratty, you know, kid. And I feel like the, the way that you remove the origin from him and him going down a path of just like you know a, a bratty rich kid i can see that but then i feel like it also removes part of the character where he, he's traumatized yes and, and he he's hardened he, he he not doesn't learn something necessarily but it removes an aspect of uh unfortunate maturity and you know that spawns mm-hmm. into him becoming um uh, Batman ultimately like I don't see the trajectory yeah. here at the moment yeah same 
Well, we, we haven't seen his inciting incident yet that turns him into Batman either. So that's fair. That's okay. Be. Yeah. But even still, like being Batman has to be a, a lifelong pursuit. So, you know, even, even within this, like even physically, I'm not totally sure how you get Batman from here. Well, by the end of the book, he is 18. So if we can get to a place between like I don't think that I don't think that this 18 year old kid will become Batman, you know, in a few days. I, I get the impression that he's gonna there's gonna be an inciting incident that's gonna lead to him coming up with Batman and then becoming that character. Um, with all of the things that we associate, maybe, maybe not all, but with many of the things that we associate with Batman. But I look at those first few pages and I don't necessarily think we're going to get the master martial artist who traveled the world and has a, you know, I don't think that's where they're going. And I don't think this is a world that's going to necessitate that. I think what they need is a man who's willing to act. And I think he's that. I also, with the, the, I guess, supposed introduction of multiversal stuff on the way. Um, I wonder if he gets shown another version of himself and what he could have been. Um, mm. Because we have Pariah in this and he directly references 1985, which is Christ of the Infinite Earths. So mm. I'm wondering if we get, he gets held a mirror to him, like, hey, you're the screw up of the multiverse. Well, Can he be something better? Or, hmm. Did uh, did it, any of you guys read the uh, the Superman Space Age? I know we did the first or second issue on the show, but I, I didn't uh, didn't continue after that. I didn't follow through with it, Not but lost, I, I right? this is that same Batman, I believe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, it's that same Batman. I believe so. I read the solicitor oh, issue too, too, and it takes an interesting turn as well. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I think you guys are right in that this will definitely give us a different Bruce and a different Batman as a result of that. But I think that's why I care to continue with this, because I really, 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 really don't ever need to read or see Bruce's Batman's origin ever again. If it's not going to be different for a, a good reason. And this feels different. It remains to be seen whether it's for a good reason. But the quality of the creative team attached, the Allreds are phenomenal. And then I think Mark Russell's great too. So all of those things make me feel safe in saying that like I want to continue with this. There's enough here. And I think the creative team enough is is like like I could trust that, that team. Um, and oh, the story's shit. weird enough. To be like, all right, well, even though I'm a little uneasy on where I stand with it, it's weird enough where I'm like, yeah, I still want to see more. I'd take uh, all red art, man. Not it for me. I don't get it. it I, I don't get it. Like, I, I, there's a style there, and I respect that he has a style, but characters feel squat to me. Um, the lines on faces feel pasty and waxy. Um, I, things are stiff where I feel like he can, he can be more flexible. Sure. It's cartoonish and that's, that's totally fine. That's not a, that's not a knock on anything, but I, I don't have the, the, I, I, I don't, I don't understand why it's so well regarded. I think it's cause there's nobody out there that does it like him and fair, fair, right? Like if, if no one else does cool, but, um, doesn't mesh for me. I'm glad other people do like it, though. I like the design of this Batman for some bizarre reason. I don't know why Thick I like underwear. it, but I like it. It's it's just, yeah, I don't know. It's classic. It's different. It's, I don't know. The one issue I did have with this was like, there's no way Bruce is going to be in a nursing home with other people. Like, <laughs> that dude has so much money. He couldn't get at-home care, really. 
Maybe something I, happens. Maybe he loses yeah, it. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I I thought a lot about that too, and I was like, wait, this doesn't add up. But I I, I was remind where I was taught that this is just not that same Bruce, and the story is likely to end in a radically different way that makes that make sense down the road. So I'm withholding my judgment on things like that for now. Um, did you guys have any thought that maybe that comedian in the middle of the book was the Joker or like as close as we're going to get to that character in this world? Mm, I, I, I thought that at first, but then for some reason he started to look like a real life person and yeah. I couldn't yeah. put my finger on who it was. I kind of felt like a maybe a young Jack Kirby. I was getting Jerry Lewis from it. I wondered that too, yeah. Um, but then I also um there's this guy in the uh he's got like red hair mm -hmm. and uh oh yeah, green shirt with purple yep. stripes. Yeah. I thought I fi I figured that was him. Yeah. You'd see he's got like weird eyebrows and a big chin. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, like the like the pointing up and big smile. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I thought I saw that one too. I went in thinking that all right, this is set in nineteen fifties currently. Um, it's got to be Dean Martin or Jerry Lewis. Yeah, because it did look. You mark it. You're right. It looked different enough where I was like, he's referencing someone here. Right. Exactly. There yeah. was something there. Hmm. We'll see about that. Um, what I I I. I got I looked at the the back of this um of this issue and I actually was shocked just now because I realized this comic was 5.99. Now, that is a different matter altogether. <laughs> that is a diff you better not DC think that I'm going to pay 5.99 for all these issues of this comic book. I mean, it is extended. It's it's not it's not just 20 some odd pages. So there is that. Ah, uh, damn. Never mind. I, I take back what I said. I'll I think it. you will. <laughs> I'll buy it. It was pretty good. It's 48 to me. I like pages. It. Yeah. I mean, you're at least getting more page count for it. Yeah. It's Sean, justified. It's justified. Physically, is it the weird format or is it the no, normal format? Just okay. regular. Yeah. Weird format. Thick, you know what I meant by that. Yeah. And it's Oof. not, it's not a black label book. Dan says Space Age was nine ninety nine an issue. Yeah, oh yeah, five ninety nine. Yo, they can nine ninety nine. Who, who? What the fuck do they think they have? Nine. Do you know what I could do for nine nine ninety nine? Well, That's crazy. By three issues. Well, two issues. Yeah, he's right. Jesus, you I'm buy the Space whole Age of right fucking yeah. primer and have a better time. Frankly, yeah. literally. <laughs> to be fair, eighty pages for that. Those were 80 page issues. So if oh. this is 48 pages at six dollars, it the trajectory matches. It maths. That maths. It, it kind of maths out. It's just at the at the at once price is like crazy. Yeah. It's not it's not it's not my job to do the math. <laughs> right, right. I got you. I got you. I'm doing it right now. Cool. And, that, and that one was only three issues, Superman Space Age. This one looks like it's more than three issues, so it looks like they're doing the same thing, but they've learned their lesson and they're spreading it out more. I sure. like that. Yeah, uh, It's a pull for me. Mm, it's a pass. It's a pass for me, too. I wasn't crazy about... I wasn't crazy about Space Age, and this didn't do that much for me. Um, I'm just not terribly interested in these worlds. Fair. It's fair. Uh, Atomic Count said, I love this. The last line blew my mind. Um, Michael Hughes think, says, go ahead, sorry. I think Hound is who that's for. Mm. Hound and, and you know, the folks like him. Because hmm. I think Russell and Allred are really, it seems like they're trying to build to something. Given yeah. that it it lines up, you know. Well, now I got to go back and read Space Age. That was that was the same creative team, yeah? Yep. Yeah. Okay. If he's cooking something, Mark Russell. I trust Mark Russell is the thing. See, I'm iffy on Mark Russell. Damn. I like Allred. Wow, iffy on Russell. Hmm. That's hmm. wild. Yo, I wonder why they it? don't... Go ahead. I was just saying, when's the Mark Russell month coming up? I don't know. 
And you hardly get Tom King month around here. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I like it. I think it's interesting, and I want to see, I want to see what else they're gonna do. I wish they'd get Mark Russell on a mainstream book, though. I want to see what he does with like, yeah, something Flash in continuity. Ooh, Flash with this Psy after post Psy. Oh. Got me sighing. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Dan says Sean never answered what he'd do with nine ninety nine, dude. I could do a lot of things with nine. Did you buy a Klondike bar? If a Klondike bar cost me, first of all, I can't eat it. But if a Klondike bar <laughs> cost me nine ninety nine, I'd be fucking pissed. That's a lot of money. <laughs> nine ninety nine isn't even going to get you a McDonald's meal at this point. <laughs> got a pint of Hagen Dazs. He can't uh, do that. Why are you just giving him options that, that he can't have? That's oh, that's right. <laughs> I would get popcorn at the moon. No, I wouldn't. I would not get popcorn. Well, that's gonna that's gonna be way way more than nine ninety nine. You can't you right. can't even get the good looking popcorn bucket at that point either. I think that's that's the nachos. Also true. Oh, not the cheese. Mark, Damn. Oh my god. Sorry, Dude. I'm just I'm thinking of stuff I would eat, and I'm like, can he do that? No. Yeah, you're you're fasting. You're fasting right now, <laughs> bro. You can literally get almost any streaming service you want, if not any streaming service you want, at the ad tier. For nine ninety nine, at the broke tier. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, it's ridiculous. Um, but yeah, we mentioned the fact that this won the the listener poll, so I want to talk about that. This book was this was the most votes we've ever gotten. Uh, in the poll, I said last week we could break the record. You guys came through. You broke the record. Thank you for that. Appreciate you. It doesn't matter to me as much what won. I just care about the fact that we broke the record. And I want to do it again. I think we've got some great books on the next poll. And I deliberately made it tough. This is one of the toughest polls we've done. So yeah. we have, so far in the poll, we have Immortal Thor number 9, which is at 37% of the vote, followed hotly by Birds of Prey number 8. Out Kelly Thompson. You put in the Shh. underwear issue in the poll, Sean? Yes, oh, I am. Damn, yes, bro. I am. If you guys want to, if you guys want us to read the underwear issue and review it on Pals Pools, you have got to go vote. I say this. I say if you listen to Pals Pools, there's no reason for you not to vote. Because you're gonna hear what we what we have to say about the books that you're voting for. So there, there's no reason not to vote. But also, Void Rivals, number eight, at 16%. And The Sacrificers, number seven, also at 16%. Tried to offer up some indies. They're getting creamed right now, but things can change. Uh, when I when I voted for uh, Sacrifices, is Remender, yeah. yeah okay. uh, when I voted for Immortal Thor at the beginning of the show, uh, it was losing to Birds of Prey by like 5%. So this is a hot, a hot week. Let's do it. Let's let's get those votes up. Let's let's get let's break the record again. I think we can absolutely do that. Absolutely. What was the record? 172. Let's go, baby. All right. Let's get into the six fingers number two. Oh shit, I forgot about that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Pull that up real quick. Jesus Christ. Written by Dan Waters with art by Sumit Kumar, Lee Lowridge on colors, and did your bit of car on the letters. Uh, Tom Muller lending his design skills to this book. Uh, oh, and Will Dennis. Will Dennis on the edits. That's cool. Uh, Will Dennis, um, good guy. So this issue, uh, more of the same, more of the mystery. Um, I, I think that I don't care too much about this. I think I need to trade weight this. Ooh. Like it's all yeah. like it's all interesting and there's stuff, but it's like, okay, there are a lot of comics that come out every month. I don't really want to sit and have to de decipher everything that's going on here. I'm sure it's all real good, but month over month, I I don't know. Like I really love the last issue. This yeah. one I was like, wait. Yeah. And and that's kind of how I felt about um the one hand whenever we did it last it's just there's 
so much going on and there's so much detail that I just like, I, I think I need to take all of this in at once. And I never say shit like that. I never feel like that, but this is just, there's, it's two series that are both doing this and they're dense and there's complicated stuff going on. And I, I don't know, like I, I, I didn't hate this at all. I liked it a lot, but even, even just to review it, like, I don't even know what to say. Because it feels very much like a chapter in a much larger story rather than an issue that you can get a lot out of unto itself. I'm kind of liking it. Uh, I almost said weekly, but monthly. Um, I kind of like being ping-ponged around. Are you... Are you? Do you remember what happened in the previous issues? Like... Like every time I pick one up, I'm yeah. like, I, I remember the, the bones of it, but like, I know there's smaller stuff that I'm not remembering. Oh, I'm, I'm, I guarantee you I'm missing some, some small stuff, you know, uh, but I'm, but I'm, I'm getting the majority of it. Like I can remember the last the issue one of six fingers and then what, like, I think once I read issue three of one hand, there'll be something in that that I can then be like, oh yeah, I remember that from six fingers number two. Um, I think they're yeah. playing with the release schedule pretty nicely where like six fing- uh, the one hand number two, I saw something happen in, in six fingers number one. It's confusing as I say it <laughs> and I'm stumbling over my, my words as I'm trying to explain it. But I'm I'm liking it. It's different. I have not experienced something like that in comics. And I'm enjoying it for what it is. And I also like I'm a sucker for a noir thing. So I really like the one hand more. Yeah. But so- this there's enough here to keep me interested in this that I think will reward me for reading the one hand as well. Uh, I've been enjoying this as a like psychosis type story. I like that. And I think uh, the noir aspect of one hand is a lot of fun, but this as, you know, he's slowly devolving um, him as a character here. It, I, I like it. I, I, I like that this is the, the, uh, the trajectory. You know? Losing yourself, the introduction of this um, what's her name? Um, I'm forgetting her name, but the the art, uh, the gallery person, um, Ada, just Ada, just kind of uh, being in the in the mix and a potential future character to explore the 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 way that they're looking at art, um, and then when you do get that cross with Ari, and he's like looking for him and he's like, I'm, I'm going to confess. I need to tell somebody and he can help me solve that problem. I thought that would be a cool spin on the book uh, before ultimately he seems to walk away. And um, yeah, I, I'm, I, I'm enjoying this so far. I'm, I'm, I'm having fun here. I, I don't want to come across as like cavalier, I, th- like the book is good and, and there's definitely good stuff happening. I, I appreciated the conversation between uh, uh, Johans and the, uh, the art curator Ada, I guess. I I thought yeah. there was good stuff there. I feel like there's a lot you can extrapolate. Um, maybe when I read this, I just wasn't ready to do all that work. Um, but you know, I found myself a little bit frustrated. Like we just saw him at we just saw Ari at the uh, at the party in the last issue of the other book, and I thought, and we I think we all at the time thought, oh, okay, yeah, this is happening that same night that Johans was there. And Ari was there at the same time. But if I read this correctly, it turns out that this is that that scene actually takes place not that day, but another day where there were where where Johans was at that place. So it's just like I have to think about two different comics at once and what happens in them and place those things together. And it's a lot. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but it's a lot. Fair. Yeah. Art's phenomenal, by the way. Yeah, 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 absolutely. The way um, and Dow brought it up in the chat, and I, well, this is what I wanted to talk about with the book was the way that the um, the this book devolves into Johann's uh, dream state. You know, he goes from completely uh, in control, and we're you know we're with him the whole time, and then he puts his finger on the wall. And all of a sudden, 
you know, it's like it's like that post nut clarity. He comes, you know, he wakes up and there's blood on the wall and his clothes are gone and there's a dead guy in the room. Um, but the the book, the book, it it gives you an example of his dreams, and then it tells you, look at the clock. Because the clock is how you will know whether or not it's a dream. Um, and so, you know, once he's in this um, this state and he's uh, frantic and he doesn't know what to do, it feels very dreamlike. Like I was reading that, I didn't totally, like it didn't feel like reality. Um and especially as he's, you know, looks like he's running through like machinery or something. Um, and that was like, what the hell? Where did that come from? Um, but then he looks at the guy's watch and it's ticking. So it's, so this is reality. I read it differently, um, actually. That, that the, the, the clock part of it. Um, oh. I read it as his theory on what dreams are is not foolproof and that a dream yes, could yes, still because in in his dream the clock ticks like in the midst of this yeah. you know car yeah. accident that he causes or whatever he tells us that you know he he he's describing this dream he had where he you know, received a, a an arrowhead I've never seen an arrowhead look like that in my entire life word um, um, his father gave, gives him this arrowhead and he says it's a dream he knows in the dream that it's a dream so he looks at the clock the problem becomes the clock ticks and so we transition back to now and he's like oh my god this is a dream but the clock is ticking I like all that I thought all that phenomenal, was really yeah. well done phenomenal work yeah. Yeah. Like, I think Kale and I are both sort of saying the same thing where we think the book's great. I sort of just want to digest it all at once. And it's never a feeling I have. It's worth pointing out that the way this is going to be collected is actually um, not as separate books, but as one book together. Oh, oh good. Yeah, dude. Okay. Awesome. Okay. I did. In, in sequential order. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sweet. Hmm. I wonder how that works with the very different art styles. I wonder how that, that reads. I wonder how it's going to work with price. If I'm honest. Same. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking that and then like distribution of funds. <laughs> the, the image uh, first trade being 10 bucks is not happening with this one. <laughs> but even if it's double that, that's still cheaper than a Marvel first trade. So, um, Paul, if you're ready to do some 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 homework, you know, uh, if you're ready to, you know, study two books, because I I'm sort of well, I was going to say I'm sort of getting to the point where I don't even know if they work alone, the books, and maybe they do. It's maybe too early to say um, if you don't know that if you if you haven't read the one hand, then this is the first time you're seeing Ari be here. Whatever, okay, he's here. He's some detective. It doesn't necessarily matter that you don't know who he is. Because I'm sure they're going to have conversations in this book that will allow you to know who Ari is. And if you care to know more of who he is, you could read the other book. I'd be curious you... if anyone, any of the listeners are only reading one of these. Because like, I can't unring that bell for myself, so it's hard for me to yeah. tell how it reads. But Yeah. Cool. Definite pull. Yeah, yeah, it's a pull. Yeah. Yep. Uh, pull, but trade weight for, yeah. for me. <laughs> Personal trade weight. I'm definitely in. Do you guys want to continue to follow both these series here? I want to do what the listeners want us to do. Fair, but what do you guys want? Howard. I do not. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to. Uh, I, I'm enjoying both, and I think the novelty of it being into two books is interesting enough for us to review. I'm 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 liking it and I'm liking reading it issue by issue, but I do feel that it's so frequent that we're always talking about it on the show. Does that make sense? There's two of them. Yeah, yeah, so. Also just from like a, a logistical standpoint, 
it's there they essentially have to be both read yeah so they guarantee take up a slot on the show yeah. and you can't miss an issue with a book like this so it's a little bit annoying in that yeah. sense as well just in terms of the, the also, layout of the show yeah and i also think at a at a certain point like with the the mystery like we're gonna hit a point where it's gonna be hard to talk about and I think we might have hit that today. Like I, I had my cool moment, but like, you know, what? At some point, there's going to be a middle chapter that's like, well, this progressed it to the next thing, and right. that's good, but nothing happened. Yeah, I, I think I agree. Um, Dow said maybe because I'm not reading a ton of comics, but this in the one hand was fun. No, that's totally cool, and I and I think that 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 they are they are fun. They are good comics. Um, you know, it's really not a reflection on the quality. What we're saying and, and trade waiting is a totally valid uh, way to approach comics. So, but I'm glad Thank that they're you. working for you uh, month over month. That's awesome. Uh, Dan says I think you guys have covered it well, and it would be good to find a new series to highlight. Okay. I, I, I would like to hear more thoughts, but Dan does tell the truth. It is in his name. Uh, Tom accounts is Rom V month coming to a book club near you. Ooh. I thought about Rom V month. I, and I, and I do believe that that will happen. I have a happen. list of months and his name is on the list. So. Should be happening on the fifth month of the year. I don't know what's going on, bro. <laughs> Wait, why? V. Rom V. Oh, oh yeah. okay. Fair enough. Yeah, I had to work for that too, though. So I never read Layla Star. So yeah, yeah. Did we not? Did we not review that? We reviewed the like first issue. Yeah. Oh, that's hot fire, man. Yeah. Uh, Uncanny Suit ninety seven says just got got off work. Hope you guys enjoyed the books this week. Well, thank you so much for hoping that. I think we mostly enjoyed them. Um, hope you had a good uh, uh, shift at work. Haven't seen your name before. Thank you for hanging out with us. Appreciate that. Oh, you had a follow-up. Thank you, guys. I'm definitely for you guys reviewing World's Finest from here on out with all the issues, but I've been drudging through Krakoa. I'm at least curious to see that. <laughs> Listen, at this point, I think we're all drudging through Krakoa. Like, yeah. like, there are diamonds in the rough. Specifically, Resurrection of Magneto has been phenomenal, and I think you can, you can say the same about X-Force being a diamond in the rough, but boy, oh, boy. Some of these books are uh, tough to get through. Some of those diamonds are sinister, and let me tell you, not great. <laughs> so, so those are the books. Those are the books. But we are not done. We are not done because, of course, we still have to talk about the stack. We've got to get through the stack. For those of you who are unfamiliar, I, I put myself out there on Front Street, and I share with you all all the books that I bought this week and you guys have to tell us how many you think I bought before I get to reveal it. How many do you think I bought? That's the game. Leave your answers in the comments. I want to see what, how many books you guys thought I bought. This was a big week, of course, in comics overall, Man. so much so that we had a six review week. So factor that into your thoughts. And just like last week, I am feeling generous. So I will give away, just like I did to James Jones last week, who ended up choosing Invincible Iron Man number 16, I will give away the code of any Marvel book that we did not review on the show. So any of the Marvel books in my stack that we didn't review, I have a code to give away to the person or people who got the closest to the amount of comics that I bought without going over. Oh, we got numbers flooding in. <laughs> I, hmm, should I go first? Sure. I want to go 19. Hot damn. Oh, I think nice. it's a big week, and I'm looking at this list, and I see a lot of things that I think Sean will get. And also, there's a Hercules Disney comic coming out. Sorry, previews is there. I'm going to say... Can I ask a question, Sean? Sure. Uh, uh, did you drop Flash? Don't answer. Um, I'm not going to answer that. I'm going to say 16. So we've got we've got Hound for 16, Roboters for 14, Dan for 15, Vengeance for 12, James Jones' lucky number is 15, Marowak on 14, Dow on 13, Justin on 13, Rami on 15, Smokey Collects on 
12 and 10. <laughs> Put ten. two on 12 and 10. Yeah, this sounds I, like uh, what Bruno Mars hears. <laughs> I think I'll go 17. Ooh. Okay, so Tyler, you were at 19. 19. Kale at 17 and Marco at 16. Okay. Yes, sir. I went under last time. I, I think I might go over this time, but I think I got it, man. I think I nailed it. Okay. Okay. Now I actually this week was this was the first week that I can remember where I had to actually look at my receipt. <laughs> this is important information you should have shared earlier. No, nope, didn't share it on purpose. <laughs> And I actually have it right in front of me, and I'm thinking about whether or not I want to show it off. Probably won't, but I will tell you all the books I bought this week. So get that baby off. We're starting at six. Right. Off rip, the six that we reviewed for the show. Yep. Amazing Spider-Man number 46. Yep. Of course. How could I not? This book's been fucking great. Gang war aside, the last issue 45 was real good. Can't wait to dive into this one. Miles Morales, issue 18 slash 300, somehow. Not on my list. How, what the hell? How did, they, how did they get to 300? 300. Is it the original numbering of Ultimate Spider-Man? It has to, it has to be, right? Yeah, yeah it's got to be. Sure. Because there, there haven't been 300 individual no. non-Ultimate Miles comics in 10 years. No. Maybe if you're counting champions and his run on Avengers, like you'd have to really. You'd be counting books that aren't Miles. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> He's just in just appearances. But then, I, Civil then War I'd argue two. you'd have to yeah. count the other three Ultimate Spider-Man books that are currently out. So I don't, I don't like that. Unreal, unreal. Uh, the Ministry of Compliance, number four. Oh, we're going. It's over nineteen, guys. I'm calling it right now. <laughs> Dude, see, you you feel like you know what I buy, but I'm telling you, man, I got surprises up my sleeve because even I don't know what I buy. I've never heard of the Ministry of Compliance. So. Well, I read the first issue. Uh, one of the listeners, um, Mike, Momentum Mike Elliott, oh, asked yeah, yeah. me what I thought about it, and I said I would I would give it a shot, and I did, um, and it's good. I, I left other thoughts in the Patreon chat, but uh, we're in the stack, so I'll, I'll continue. Uh, Somna... Number uh, three, number three, probably. Apparently. I got look. I got the. I'm uh, I'm doing it. I'm buying the poly bags. Man, you Maybe. you you picked up that book, handed it to another human being, and made eye contact. <laughs> so let me tell you something, Tyler. <laughs> and this is the truth. A few years ago, I would not buy the poly bagged, like obviously like nudie covers because. I didn't want to do what you just said. And at some point, something happened in my brain where I decided that I don't give a fuck. Something just snapped in me. <laughs> I feel like it did because now I do it and I don't even think about it. I do not care. I just don't really care what other people think. Hands so, it with a smile. That was yeah. that was me and AMC asking for a, a Dune popcorn bucket with no ticket. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know what no, I'm here see, for. <laughs> there's a, yeah, there's a difference. You have problems. <laughs> <laughs> that's four uh, extra that's 10 yeah, incredible 10. hulk number 10 of course yep. Yep. great comic uh daredevil number seven how's that been don't know and also Tremendous. not happy with the cover gotta tell you not what's, happy ooh. what's the legacy yes. number on that one so the legacy number is 669 and nice. the cover is wolverine and daredevil uh and it's by uh, uh, Ramita. Ooh. It's a Ramita. And I'm not happy. I wish I didn't have this cover. However, I didn't like any of the other ones. Gods, number six. Is it good? Who knows? Um, <laughs> it is. Monstrous, Monstrous Ooh, 50. 50. Bro, yeah. you bought that? I bought, I own every issue of Monstrous Do you Marco. really yes, know absolutely. it? Guys, we're over. We're, we're going to like... Uh, maybe mid twenties at this point. I'm telling you, Tyler, dude. <laughs> let me tell you something. I haven't read Monstrous Shave. in years. We fell off at like the same point. I feel yeah, like. yeah, <laughs> like like in the twenties ish. I want to yeah, say early twenties too. Yes, Sean. My and, nineteen is based on what I know you read. So if we're already showing you at least four books that I don't, I didn't know you were reading or buying. Rather, we're dude, we're listen, gonna be up there. 
and I got more surprises coming. Uh, fa- I bought Feral number one. Oh, nice! I can't wait to read that one. Yeah, I, it's exactly my first Tony is. Fleeks, so I want to try it. Oh, good. Uh, Alan Scott, Green Lantern number five, of course. There's yeah. mine. That's it. <laughs> that's it. That's all you got. That's sixteen. That's, that's sixteen. It. Oh, I don't know if anybody got it then, because I'm not done. Uh. <laughs> What is this? Detective Comics number 1083. Yeah. I think that's me. I said 17. Yeah, yeah. Still not done. Uh Red Sonia number nine. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, yeah, you I know I read Tyler. I, yeah, I forgot I, that. That's I, 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 t- I, I talk know, every time about how much I love two things yeah, yeah, Red yeah, Sonia yeah. and Torn Gronbeck. And yeah, I think I get I, I forget every time. <laughs> <laughs> Wolverine. Number 46. Yep. Wars. Sabretooth War Part 6. <laughs> Michael, you in the chat. Now we know what Sean would do with the 999. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Stewart. man. Holly Bag. Yeah, that's right. Hell yeah, bro. Dude, don't start. I was tempted. <laughs> I was tempted this week. They had a copy of, well, I wasn't. It was my cousin. Uh, Jean Grey number one. <laughs> Jean Grey number one, a series I didn't even like. The Variant. It was so beautiful, dude. And it was 25. And I was like, you know what? I want this so bad. I really do. Stay tuned to see if I bought it. Um, (laughs) Or if my cousin bought it. Zorro, Man of the Dead, number three. Still buying this. That's 20. That wow. We're at intervention levels right now. We need to have a serious discussion. Wow, (laughs) dude. I fucked up this week. This is bad. Yeah, you relapsed hard this week. Woo! No control. X Men ninety seven number one. Yeah, yeah. How could I not? How could I not? Come on, it is. It is. Uh, you, you know how you don't. You just don't. Yeah, but I want it. It's the prequel to the show. How could I not? I ha- Wasn't I ha- the pre? Didn't that already come out? Uh, did it? I don't what was know. The, I... What was the? What was the? Like a couple of years ago, where um, Jubilee was more. Oh, yeah, 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 oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. It was House of. Something. whatever and also yeah. the prequel to the show is the show <laughs> okay wow. right of course and that's it that 21 is 21 that is a new yeah. record for pals pulls for the stack Nobody segment that is a new wow record. and you know what tack on 22 just for that comicsology subscription oh yeah of course <laughs> yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, hmm. no uh no duke wait duke came out i thought yeah. it was a reprint no duke number four came out Oh, uh, no flash, right? Well, we, we oh, yeah, discussed, yeah, yeah. Uh, fuck the flash, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> bro. I wasn't, I wasn't sure if you were gonna try, um, Jack, Jackpot and Black Cat, but I guess not. Oh, god, <laughs> I, I avoid books like that, like the plague, if I can. If it's not for Pals Pulls, I'll never buy that. So, it ain't gonna be for Pals Pulls. <laughs> <laughs> well, so consider, uh, uh, add another one next week when Sean buys Duke. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have. I've been enjoying Duke, so I'm gonna have to pick yeah, that up. Yeah, Duke's good. So who came closest to the number twenty-one? It was Tyler. Yeah, Tyler, uh, and honestly, Atomic Hound. It looks like it the original got 16. sixteen. Yeah. Wow! Everybody's so far under. Wow! Yeah, and after Hound, the closest is uh, Dan and uh, James and Rami. For fifteen, yeah. So yeah. you guys, you guys think better of me than I actually am because I did not control myself this week. I, I fucked up. Um, Roboter says so. This really has just encouraged Sean to pick up as much as he can per week. Sean Stack about to tip over <laughs> like it's Jenga, dude. I I truly don't do that. I really don't. These are the books that I would have bought if I didn't have a podcast. I just this is just who I am. I've seen Sean, the stack guys. Sean is, <laughs> Sean is like these people that their life's ambition is to climb Mount Everest. And then they die on the way up. Whoa, what? Darby Allen? Can you explain that? Uh, You're accomplishing your goal, but you are killing yourself doing it. <laughs> what? What is my goal? To buy comics. Ah, okay, well then. Yes, you're living I- your dream. I, I, I agree with that. My goal is to buy comics. Um, 
Uh, Dan, I imagine Sean's house being so full of comics, they're falling out of the cupboards as he opens them. Close. <laughs> okay, close. Can't shut any drawers for sure. <laughs> James Jones, what the heck, Sean? Where are you keeping all of these? Is your home a TARDIS? No. No, but uh, I have more than one place where I keep my comics. I was, I was going to say, you have a very patient girlfriend. <laughs> that is also true. That is also very true. But that is the stack. Uh, so we decided Atomic Hound was the closest. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, Hound, if you want any of the codes for any of the books that we didn't talk about on the show, any of the Marvel books, I will happily send them your way. And if you don't, then any of the people who had the number 15 can also reach out and I will share codes. I don't mind. You guys are cool enough to hang out with us and do this. So I'm happy to give you codes. The next time we will be live with you is this Saturday for the main show. Uh, AI is all over the place. That is the hot button topic in oh. comics. And we are going to engage in that conversation oh. yet again. Ed oh. Pisker was revealed as a scumbag. We are going to dunk on him and discuss that this Saturday. So come hang out with us at 10, 15 a.m. Eastern. I promise you, you're going to have a great time. I cannot wait to do this show. I will see you then. Until then, take care, guys. See you next.